Hi, I'm Chris Cooper. Welcome to the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Thanks for joining us. Honeybees have been mysteriously disappearing across the planet. Why is this happening? How important are bees anyway? Today, we're going to find out more about bees, their role in pollination, and what beekeepers are doing to help the situation. We also talk about the use of cover crops in vegetable gardening. All that and more is just ahead on the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, so stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is David Glover. David is the Bartlett Bee Whisperer, okay? And That's Mr. Right. D is here. Thanks for joining me. I'm the Hall's Bee Screamer, if I'm okay. singing. <laughs> I guarantee that. All right, well look, Mr. David. Yes. You brought us bees. I got bees. Okay, we definitely appreciate that. Now let's get to a couple of questions, all okay. right? So last year, we recorded a 37% national loss of bees. Tennessee lost 24 percent. So what's killing the bees? Yeah, that's a big question. Uh, not only is it a question for the beekeepers, but it's also a good question for gardeners mm -hmm. and for the, uh, well, the big crop builders, the guys who are out there making our food, the things that we eat. When you get in the laboratory and look at it, some of the, some of the things that are going on are diseases. Some okay. are pests, some are mites or parasites, but if you look back over the last 200 years at everything that's gone extinct, there's one common factor, man. One way or another, man has done something to either encroach upon where they live, where they forage, or change their environment to the nature that they don't have a place to stay anymore. Mm. So ultimately, I think man is responsible one way or another. One way or another. Manicured yards, well, we get rid of the, have the manicured yards, we have the herbicides that go out there and get rid of the weeds. We get rid of the natural foraging that the bees have, the food that they would, well, put diversity in their diet. Mm -hmm. We have situations where we take bees out of a normal situation and put them into a forced pollination where they're sitting on one crop. Mm -hmm. Now, I like steak. <laughs> But could you imagine eating steak for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for two months? I don't think I like steak that much. Then. Not, not <laughs> much diversity. Mr. thinking about it. <laughs> He's thinking about it. You can try, but there's not nah. much diversity in the diet. And when we have that lack of diversity in diet, we're more susceptible to disease. Sure. And uh, there are a lot of different things that happen with that. Uh, for me, I think it's things we're doing. Okay. Uh, now, we have a lot of diseases out there. We have a lot of imported parasites. The small hive beetle came in and it's destroying hives like crazy. In fact, uh, all of the hives that I lost last year, I didn't lose them to a pesticide or an herbicide or anything strange. I lost them to one pest, the small hive beetle. Okay. Well, look, let, let me ask you this then. So do we really need bees? Well, of course we need bees. That? We need bees because they pollinate our food. Okay. And we have natural pollinators. We've got leaf cutters, we've got bumblebees, we've got a lot of different other creatures out there. But the thing about the honeybee is their fidelity. When they go out and they pollinate something, they're going to stay on that one flower all day long. Okay. And so with cucumbers or watermelons, every seed has to be pollinated for the flesh to grow around that seed. And if that seed doesn't get pollinated, then you've got a, a misshapen watermelon, mm -hmm. a misshapen cucumber. Think about the squash plants. The squash are a little bit different in that they can't self-pollinate. They have two different flowers. They right. have a male and a female flower. And the pollen has to go from the male flower all the way over to the female. So a pollinator has to move that. I mean, we could use Q-tips. Uh, we could go out with the <laughs> feather and we could dust them, but the bees are a lot more productive at it than sure. we are. Same sure. thing is true for pumpkins, isn't it? 
pumpkins and other squash. Right, it's yeah. a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. but yeah. the same principle. Yeah. And what happens is because we get honey from the honeybee, and because the bee is such a good pollinator, we recognize losses of the honeybees. We don't see the losses on bumblebees or butterflies or our leaf cutters or um, all these other pollinators, sweat bees. Mm -hmm. They're pollinators too, but we don't count them because they don't provide something that man right. needs directly. Right. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Uh, now, can we have bees in our yard? I know more people are interested in that. So You, you can if you've got really good neighbors. <laughs> but the, the big thing in having bees in your yard is to check with your city ordinances. Sure. Check with your municipality. See what you can have. Okay. Uh, some people have chickens in their yard, and they're allowed X number of chickens per member of the family. Okay. Well, what about the us other, here in Shelby County then? So in the Shelby County, say? we have bees in our yards. Okay. And also check with your neighbors. Sure. Okay. And it's always good to give the neighbor a jar of honey at the end of the year, but if, you're, if your neighbor <laughs> is carrying an EpiPen, that's probably not a good thing to do because yeah. they're allergic to the bees, and you don't want that liability on yourself. Uh, both neighbors, both sides of my house carry EpiPens. Wow. So I have no bees in my yard, sure. but I have a relationship with farmers so that I have you know, hives out on their farms. They're doing their job, and we split the honey at the end of the year. Good deal. Let me ask you this too. How long do bees live? Hmm. Individual bees. Mm. The worker bee can live for up to six weeks during the summer. Okay. And the reason they die isn't because of natural death. They've worked themselves to death. Their wings are so frayed that they can no longer fly and they usually die out in the field. About this time of the year, the worker bees can live up to four months. Wow. Okay. Because they're balling up and getting ready for winter and they're not flying as much. Okay. Uh, the other two bees in the house would be the queen and the drones. Drones have it pretty good. All they do is sit back and eat, drink, have fun. They <laughs> wait for a new queen to show up and mate with mate, her. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, they die when they do that. Wow. But, uh, come the end of August, September, October, the drones are all kicked out of the hive because they are freeloaders. They're mm -hmm. not doing anything for the hive. So they get kicked out and they die in the winter. So one season for drones. The queen... She's good for five years. Five years. She's so we mark for a while. We mark them so we know how old the queen is. Okay. Well, let me ask you this then. How many bees are in a hive? Okay. Let's go into dynamics. Okay. If a worker bee can live for six weeks, the queen lays between 1,500 and 2,000 wow. eggs a day. Wow. Short math, yeah. you're looking at about 80,000 bees if all of those bees lived for six weeks. Okay. A good hive, you're going to have forty to sixty thousand bees in there. Forty to sixty thousand. Mm-hmm. Imagine them in your house. You're going to see maybe fifty moving on the outside of the house, but those forty to sixty thousand are inside your floor joist or on your wall, and you don't even wow. hear them. <laughs> kind of crazy. Yeah, that that is. Um, you know, I'm just trying to wrap my brain around the forty to sixty thousand. Uh. That's true. Uh, one the thing about bees. As they live, they produce wax. They continue producing mm. wax throughout the year. They are very productive. They're overproductive. Okay. They can put up to 300 pounds of honey in a year. Wow. That's okay. A lot of honey. They don't eat that much during the winter. Okay. Uh, you're you're good for maybe 60 pounds of honey during the winter. So next year, they put up another 300 pounds, on top of what they put up last year. Okay. Uh, well, look. Well, we just have a minute left. I definitely want to get to this. Oh, really? So what if we have a swarm? Who do we call Ooh. quickly? If you have a swarm, go online, look for your city beekeeper. Okay. Uh, Memphis area, you'll actually get on the Memphis area beekeepers list and you will see those who will go out and capture swarms. Okay. Um, if you're out rural, odds are there's a beekeeper that yeah. one of your friends know. Ask for them. They have the equipment to come and get the bees. Okay. It looks scary. They're defensive creatures. They defend hive and when they're swarming, they have nothing to defend. So technically, you could take the swarm without a suit, without gloves, without anything. But you don't know what that hive is. It could be aphrodized. They could be very sure. aggressive. Instead of getting stung once or twice, you get stung thousands of times. So call a professional. Call wow. somebody who's going to pick them up and take them away. Don't spray them. Wow. Good information. We appreciate that, Mr. David. All right. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you.
All right, Mr. D, we definitely appreciate the information from Mr. David, you know, about the honeybees. And, Outstanding. Yeah, that was real good. And speaking of, you know, honeybees, we're going to talk about winter cover crops. Right. So what do we need to know? It's a good thing. Uh, cover crops uh, will prevent erosion. Mm -hmm. And also it's, it's kind of a storage for nutri nutrients. Mm -hmm. Uh, because at the end of the season, you know, next spring, you turn that cover crop under and you basically preserve, you know, nitrogen, yeah. phosphorus, and potassium for, for next year. Uh, especially uh, the legumes, legumes like the vetches or, or clover, crimson clover, Austrian winter peas is yeah. another uh, good uh, uh, cover crop that you can put out there. Um, they're also... Uh, good for wildlife to eat on. Rabbits yeah. and deer and things like that will <laughs> like to eat on those cover crops. Um, but they, it's, it is a good thing. You need to, you need to uh, plant. It's probably a little late to, yeah. to plant some of the, the, the winter. But however, this year is strange. It's been a strange you know, normally, weather year. Normally, yeah. uh, uh, you should you know, plant by the middle of October. But uh, this is a late fall. This is, I mean, the mm. trees are just now beginning to turn, leaves are just now beginning to turn, mm -hmm. and this, this is later than normal. It's kind of, it's been a strange year all around. It has been. Okay, now, so again, do we till under, you know, our cover crops once they're finished? Right, okay. I would, I would till it into the ground, mix okay, it into the it. soil. Uh, unless, unless you want a no-till. If you want a no-till, yeah. you can simply kill that cover crop and then plant directly into the, Mm. The sod or the, the stubble, you'd probably want to mow it down okay, and, and then uh, spray it with a herbicide and no-till. So you can do that too with okay. a cover crop. Now and somebody's probably going to be wondering, is that safe to spray it with a herbicide and till it in? I mean, is that going to be okay? I'm, I didn't say spray and till it in. I said okay. spray and, and then plant into then it. Plant into it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's good to, Don't, okay. If you're going to till it in, there's no need to spray it. Okay. If gotcha. you're going to till it in, you can either turn it under. Uh, without mowing it, you can mow it down yeah. and then turn it under fairly quickly. Okay. And you steer After that. And it, actually, your cover crops are called a green manure crop. Mm -hmm. They're called a green manure crop because uh, it does some of the same things that manure, you know, does. It uh, you organic form of fertilizer that you're putting out there. Okay. And with the legumes, it's nitrogen. You know, okay. quite a lot of nitrogen. Uh, you, there are grasses that you can plant. Rye grass. Yeah. You know, you can go with annual grasses. Uh, that you can plant as a cover crop, but you, you, you're missing the nitrogen you know, component of it. Um, and I guess you have to do a real good job uh, with weed control too, wouldn't you? Right, Yeah. right. Especially if you're gonna be uh, you know, incorporating it into your soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but, but actually, if you have a good heavy cover crop, then, then you, you won't have winter weeds. Mm -hmm. They'll outcompete, hopefully they'll outcompete the winter weeds, and, and then you, it'll basically help you start clean next year because, you know, the pests that we have, pigweed and, yeah. you know, and, and things like that, uh, uh, you should have less of them if you have a good solid cover crop. Makes sense. Okay. Well, since this is, uh, we're in the fall, we're going to winter, what about our critters that are out there? Oh, Lord. Out and about uh, uh, looking for some of these uh, forage crops or, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah, uh, you've got mice and rats coming in the house now. Wow. Uh, you know, they're, they're looking for you know, a good warm place. Uh, uh, mice and rats going into bees, too. They like to go into bees. You know, mm -hmm. they're looking for honey, I guess, aren't they? A nice warm place to stay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. You, you were talking about bees in a wall. Uh, I have, a couple of times I've encountered them, and you could always you could put your hand on the sheetrock, and it's warmer. Feel the heat. It's going to be about heat. 95 degrees year 95 round. 95 degrees, almost almost body temperature. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. But uh, yeah, we uh, not only are there mammals like rats and mice coming <laughs> in, but you know, I mean we got spiders and roaches yeah. and things like that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, squirrels, you yeah. know, getting in the attic. Well, we're already getting those calls. Yeah, uh -huh. all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, and and with with. Uh, a lot of these critters, you can trap them, you know, including the insects if you use the glue traps, the sticky yeah, traps. Sure. Uh, but uh, there are uh, some insecticides, and I can I'll go over some okay. insecticides for roaches and and spiders that you might want to put out and put a barrier around your house okay. and and then and then spray inside if you've got a problem inside. And uh, but with the the squirrels, you know, and oh. and, and mice, you know, yeah. traps and 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 then there with a mat rice. 
with the rats and mice, the, the, the rice and mats, yeah. so, uh, we, uh, there are some good uh, rodenticides out there okay. that work real well. Havoc, uh, the single feeding anticoagulants mm -hmm. are probably the best um, because uh, the critters can feed on them one time. It's uh, anticoagulant, prevents mm -hmm. blood from clotting, it makes them thirsty. Mm -hmm. They go looking for water and so hopefully they'll die outside your house. And uh, there are several on the market that, that do a good job. But let okay. me mention some of okay, the, sure, uh, sure. some of the, uh, for spiders. Right. Uh, and I just, let's see some of the same things. Uh, the residuals are bifenthrin and beta cyfluthrin and lambda cyhalothrin. Those are the active ingredients that uh, our, the University of Tennessee yeah. out of the Red Book recommends to control spiders. and. I see that the same sprays are also listed for cockroaches and also for, you know, crickets. crickets. Some people don't oh. want crickets yeah. in their house. Crickets yeah. are coming inside. You know, you need a, <laughs> at least one cricket by <laughs> your heart, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, those are the, some products that will help you uh, control those, those pests. Okay. Let me ask you uh, quickly, uh, we got a call or two about armadillos. Armadillos. Yeah. Mm. They're out there now. You know, the best thing to do with an armadillo is to trap him. And uh, you, we've got a good fact sheet. Yeah, we do. Uh, a real good fact we sheet do. at, at uh, the UT Extension Office uh, uh, here in Shelby County and probably all the surrounding counties have access to the, the fact sheet. It tells you a little bit about the biology of armadillos. They're really interesting. They, they give birth to uh, four identical twins yeah. every year, and they only have those four identical twins. Four, huh? And... Um, but uh, they burrow mostly. They're looking for grub worms. Yeah. Uh, you know, white grubs. They do a lot of. Uh, grub, so they're pretty much insectivores. Feeding. Insectivores. Right. Are they earthworms? They eat earthworms Earthworm. also. Okay. Um, but if you if you use a live trap, you can bait it. Actually, I don't have my. I'm not sure what to bait it with. I need to call you and ask what to yeah. bait the sure. trap with. Do you know? Yeah, rotten fruit. Uh, okay. Yeah, peanut okay. butter, believe it or not. They like you know, that. Something they okay. like. Everything okay. likes peanut butter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, just bait trap with that. But put wings on your live trap because their eyesight is not that good. And if you have uh, one by six wings, six or eight feet long, out to the side of your trap, you can kind of actually direct them into your trap. And, uh, and then you better with armadillos. Yeah, what you do with them is... Your deal, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is our Q&A session. And Mr. David, you have a comment? You know, you want to jump in there with us? Go Just right a quick thought. Okay. Vetch and clover, um, good time to be putting them out right now because the bees are putting up their honey. Vetch and clover both uh, provide the nectar that the bees will be able to use. If you don't till it under and it flowers again later in the, in the winter, if the temperature is above 50 degrees, the bees will go out and forage on them. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't till it until next spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, don't right. till it in the winter. You know, let it grow all through the winter. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's and good armadillos. Yeah, that's, that's good enough. And armadillos, leprosy. Yes. <laughs> so make sure yeah. if Stay you're dealing with them, put on a pair of gloves. Yeah, yeah. don't have Wash them. your hands. Yeah, I wouldn't have them at all. Okay. Never been a never been a case where a human has caught leprosy from armadillos. However, they do carry their organism. Yeah. They have come but, yeah. And we don't want to hear of a case either. We don't so. want to be the first. No. no. Don't want to be the first. Here's our first question. Uh, speaking of forage crops, is it too late to plant greens? And I guess what, mustards and turnips and our charts. Our chart says September 30th is the last day to plant. She does. So if you follow our chart, yes, it's too late. However, Over. this has yeah. been, this has been a weird year. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're a little later. If I, hadn't, if I wanted turnip greens and I hadn't planted them, I would plant them. I think you could probably get away with them mm -hmm. this year. Because yeah. the weather's uh, been, so been so strange so lately. Strange. Right. Yeah, and somebody's probably sitting out there like, I just put some in, so yeah, you can mm -hmm. grow them, right? Well, our yeah. chart says September 30th. It sure does. Okay. I think it's about from July to like September the 30th, mm -hmm. you know, for most of your greens. Okay, here's our second question. Uh, can I add wood ashes to my garden soil? Yes. Yes. You know the, you know what patent, U.S. patent number one huh. was? I think it's 1795. U.S. patent number one. Number one. one was fertilizer made from wood ashes. <laughs> okay. It was basically wood ashes. We patented it and, and we shipped a lot of uh, uh, wood, ash, wood ashes back to England <gasps> after we wow. beat them in the Revolutionary War. <laughs> but yes, uh, you can. Uh, I think uh, wood ashes has, what, 45% the 
liming activity as yep. calcium carbonate. So, so it takes a little bit more wood ash to raise pH than it would yeah. uh, uh, lime. I, I mean, I say a little more, at least twice as much yeah. wood ash. Uh, you can put too much of it out. Yes, you can. So, so put it out, at, treat it as if it's a fertilizer. You know, put it out if you need to raise your pH. Has a little bit of potash in it, it not a lot, a little bit of potash in it, and um, and that's primarily what they uh, the, the U.S. patent was for was for the potash in there, <laughs> not the liming ability. Um, but yes, you can put it out. I yeah. do. Uh, okay, you do. Okay, I do. Uh, one thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, uh, wood ash is what we're talking about. Right. We're not talking about cardboard ash and things like that because some of the, if you burn paper and cardboard and things like that, mm -hmm. the ashes might have boron in it. Okay. And you can put get too much boron. I mean, plants need boron. Right. But you Something might get too much yeah. boron out there if you're not careful. And if you use, if you do burn cardboard and, and want to put that ash out, I would do a micronutrient analysis right. from time to time. And, and if you're using wood ashes as a fertilizer, you might want to soil test a little bit more often than you normally do. I would definitely soil test because, mm -hmm. yeah, if you get too much If you get too you know, much, you can't ashes, take it out. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to make your soil alkaline. So, yeah, you definitely want to, you know, be careful with that. Sure. Don't put wood ash around blueberries, azaleas, camellias, acid-loving plants. So do not put wood ashes around those acid loving plants. Right, because right, it's going to move. It's yeah, going to raise pH. the pH. That's right. And, and, it's going to make they need a alkaline. low pH. Right. All right. Well, that's good. Hey, I didn't know you used that with, uh, used wood ashes, so that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Here's our next question. Uh, can I use a fungicide on my lawn now to kill a fungus? And I have Bermuda lawn. I wouldn't use it now uh, mm -hmm. because, look, the Bermuda wants to go dormant. It's a warm season grass. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I would do is, Next spring, during the green up period, have a look to Get see if that grass is not coming back. If it's not coming back, before I like to recommend fungicides, I always tell people to go back to your cultural practices. Right. Okay. Make sure you, you were mowing at the correct height. Make mm -hmm. sure you're fertilizing according to your soil test. Uh, make sure you're watering correctly. Do all of those things first right. before you even start thinking about a fungicide. Right. Okay. Because again, fungicide in nature is just a preventative. That's right. They're preventative in nature, and yeah. so don't let, don't wait until you have a huge problem. No. You know, keep an eye yeah. on it, and if you see a problem coming in there, hit it with a fungicide. Yeah. But, but uh, do all like you yeah, said. But, do yeah, but yeah, do all your cultural right. practices first. I mean, you have to grow a thick stand of grass. You know, you want to make sure you have good roots because good mm -hmm. roots are going to lead to good shoots. Right. So yeah. when you have good roots, you have good shoots. Your grass should be growing right, and make sure you have the right grass species for the right location. That's right. Because that's going to make a difference. Okay. And uh, our last question is this, uh, what products uh, can I use to keep bugs and spiders out of the house for the fall through the winter? Uh, we, we just talked, talked about, about that, yeah, yeah. some of those. Um, so if you get those, and, and those are readily available for the homeowners, right? That most right. of your garden centers. Any uh, lawn and garden center. Yeah, big that. box stores and things like that. Right. Because yeah, this is, uh, we're going into winter time and just like you want to be, be inside, they want to be inside too. So mm -hmm. yeah. I found a dog is pretty good too. A dog or a cat. Oh, too. Because <laughs> they'll chase them down. They'll chase them down and eat them. Oh my goodness! And what are they going to be eating? Your squirrels? Oh, your squirrels? No, I'm talking about the insects. <laughs> okay. In the house. They, they in the in. house. In the house as they come in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hmm, that's good to know. Are you need special breed that works better. I found puppies. Okay. You go out. And get one from the rescue one, huh? Yeah, rescue yeah. one. They'll they'll go after the bugs. They'll nail the bugs. Yeah, 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 I guess you have some good dogs outdoors Except that can chase away the squirrels. No, oh, they don't, no, I'm talking the bigger ones. You know, the cricket. <laughs> okay. Oh, you the cricket. Spiders, the cricket. Gally nappers, those things that fly around, and just come down low, just in range of the dog. Yeah, because we don't want those things in the house with us, right? No. All right, that's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, you can watch past episodes of the Family Plots online. Just go to WKNO.org and click on KNO Tonight. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And you can send a letter or an email with your gardening questions. The mailing address is on the screen and the email address is familyplot at WKNO.org. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot. Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.
production funding for the family plot. Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.